Survive in advance. You don't apologize for winning this time of the year. It doesn't matter. Just get that win and move on. And that is exactly what Tennessee did in the round of 32, taking down Texas to reach its 10th Sweet 16 of all time, second straight in as many years. We're going to recap that and more here on your Monday Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Monday morning, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Ball. We are a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. I'm your host, Eric Kane. Big shout out to you every day or for making this show what it is and making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day. You can watch, listen, follow, subscribe, download all that for free wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, on the Locked On Balls YouTube channel. Big thanks to our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. You can post your job for free over at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College. Terms and conditions do apply. Boy, do we have a fun show to get into here today. Tennessee survives and advances. All about Tennessee's weekend and the NCAA tournament play here in segment number one. Uh, James Pierce named ESPN's number one pass rusher in college football. And we'll agree with that, get into that in segment two and plus more from spring practice, and then a baseball roundup from the weekend play for your number eight Tennessee Volunteers. That and more coming up next here on Lockdown Vol. So, um, again, kind of like I said in the cold open, it doesn't matter. You just find a way to win. It was late, late, late Thursday night. Tennessee won by 40-plus points, or nearly 40-plus points. Um, over St. Peter's, Tennessee did exactly what Tennessee was supposed to do in that basketball game, and it moved on, you know, taking down the 15th seeded St. Peter's. No 2022 run for St. Peter's this year. Tennessee made sure of that. So you move on, and you had about the 825 tip off or whatever it was on Saturday night. Tennessee takes on Texas, two seed versus the seven seed. Rick Barnes versus his old foe, SEC versus Big 12 for now. Of course, Texas is coming into the SEC. And Tennessee led for, I want to say, 38 minutes and some change in this basketball game. And it was, it had, I would never say it was comfortable, but Tennessee had some cushion at points and times in this game. But of course, it came down to the wire, as you would expect any NCAA tournament game to go. Um, and, you know, Texas did not give up. Texas continued to swing and brought it within one, I want to say within a minute left in this basketball game. At one point in time, and, and goodness gracious, yeah, 34 seconds left. It dropped it down to one, and uh, Tennessee was still able to pull out a four-point victory at 62-58 to 58 in the Spectrum Center over in Charlotte, taking down Texas, advancing to the second straight Sweet 16, I believe the third under uh, Rick Barnes while he's been Tennessee's head coach. The second time in program history, Tennessee's gone to the Sweet 16 back-to-back -back years. The 10th overall time, Tennessee will go on to the Sweet 16, so... Um, yeah, there's a lot of things to get into from this basketball game. First, I, I mentioned surviving advance. Doesn't matter how pretty it is. Doesn't matter what it looks like. And boy, Tennessee offensively did not look great. And this is why we talk about throughout the year. Find different ways to win. Because you never know when your team, something, something about your team is going to be shut down. And you have to find another way to go and win a basketball game. And, and this team is built to win in a several different ways. But number one, Tennessee's always going to play good defense for the most part, and defense is absolutely what carried Tennessee. You know, people say defense doesn't matter in football anymore. People say defense is boring in basketball. Well, defense is the reason why Tennessee is going on to the Sweet 16. You know why? Because offensively, Tennessee shot 33% from the field. It made 22 of 65 field goal attempts did Tennessee in this basketball game. Not very good, right? Well, it gets even worse. Tennessee attempted 25 three-pointers, and Tennessee made only three. What's that come down to average-wise? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, just atrocious. 12% from three. Tennessee is moving on to the Sweet 16 after shooting 12% from downtown. Incredible. Do I think Tennessee's going to shoot 12% ever again? No, knock on wood here. But like my point remains, it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be flashy. We're not trying to impress no committee no more. This is the tournament and just find a way to win. And that's what Tennessee did. And why did Tennessee find a way to win? Well, it forced 17 turnovers. It won the rebounding battle 42 to 36. It scored 15 points off turnovers. It won the battle in the paint 36 to 20. 
it uh it, it won an offensive rebounding 14 to 7 and it meant that tennessee was able to score 12 second chance points compared to the six from texas Tennessee was able to score four points in fast break opportunities and the bench led by Toby Awaka's eight points in the first half was able to out or was able to hold its own with the bench from Texas 19 to six Tennessee again offensively it wasn't anything to write home about Dalton connect Tennessee's guy was five of 18 from the field he was one of eight from three Zakiah Ziegler a guy for Tennessee uh 12 <laughs> it still reminds me the, uh, the the publication that said that he was an irrelevant player earlier this year Nonetheless, uh, Zakai Ziegler, 2 of 12 shooting, uh, 1 of 8 again from three-point range, much like Dalton Connect. Um, those two guys were not making baskets for you. However, they did other ways. They, they performed in other ways for Tennessee to win this basketball game. Of course, uh, you had Dalton Connect who hit a three late or hit a three in this basketball game, hit a lot of free throws we'll get to here in a moment. Uh, but he co-led Tennessee with Josiah Jordan-James with nine rebounds. He got an assist. He got a couple of steals. Dalton Connect played winning basketball. Zakai Ziegler stuffed the stat sheet, okay? He had six total points, which is well below his season average, but he scored six points. He had four rebounds, had seven assists, had three steals, had one block. Zakai Ziegler just a stat sheet stuffer. Stat sheet stuffer is all he is. And Santiago Vescovi finally hit a three-pointer or finally... Hit a, hit a field goal, and, and that broke a, an ugly stretch for uh, Santiago Vescovi. Uh, finally hit a field goal and also had a couple of steals to to move into the all-time leader in steals in Tennessee basketball. Um, but Josiah Jordan-James, again, he was able to score some points for Tennessee. He had nine points, nine rebounds, a point away and a rebound away from a double-double. Um, but but he's playing winning basketball for Tennessee. Jonas Adu. Uh, wasn't his best game, certainly 4-12 shooting from the field, 11 points, but able to get down four rebounds, hit some big free throws late. It was a sequence in the last minute of play that you know really made you hold your breath if you're a Tennessee fan. Adu hits the one hits um, uh, the front end of a one and one. Um, he makes he makes or he makes one or two free throws rather. He makes one free throw at 48 seconds left in this game, and that gave Tennessee a three point lead. Well, Texas came down and made a field goal. Uh, with 34 seconds left in the ball game to cut the deficit to only one point. Texas trailed by one point with 34 seconds left in this game. Adu back to the free throw line. They fouled Adu. Why you inbound the basketball to Jonas Adu, I don't know. But Tennessee did, and he he did his job. He went to the free throw line, knocked down two with 24 seconds left, and that gave Tennessee a three-point lead. A defensive stop later, they fouled Dalton Connect. He had two free throws with eight seconds left on the clock. Gave Tennessee a five-point lead, and then Texas comes down, and it's Tyrese Hunter hits a three-pointer. They will not go quietly into the night, and Tennessee's lead now is down to two points with 4.2 seconds remaining. Again, they inbound. They get it to Dalton Connect. They foul Dalton Connect. He hits two free throws, giving Tennessee a four-point cushion there with three seconds left in the basketball game, and obviously Tennessee holds on for the 62-58 to win. Tennessee found ways to win. Late free throws cashed in, defensive presence all game long, forcing turnovers, winning the rebounding up game, harassing them defensively. I mean, look, Texas shot for the game 36% from the field, and that is not great. Texas was uh, 30% from downtown, and, and Tennessee did his job defensively for sure. And yes, everybody's going to remember how Tennessee shot so poorly from the field. And yes, Tennessee uh, becomes only the second team ever to win an NCAA tournament game shooting less than 34% from the field and under 12.5% from three-point range. Only the second team ever in NCAA history that's able to move on despite the horrific shooting woes. That's Tennessee, but again, it doesn't matter because you're going to move on. Yes, you will need to shoot better moving on if you want to beat Creighton in the Sweet 16. If you want to win an eventual matchup potentially with Purdue, um, and, and again, it's going to be Purdue and Gonzaga and their Sweet, Sweet 16 matchup. The winner of that one will face the winner of Tennessee and Creighton, and that will be your Elite Eight Regional Final Showdown. So uh, again, um, hats off to Tennessee. Uh, SEC has been <laughs> really, really bad in this NCAA tournament. Tennessee, meanwhile, says, all right, SEC, I got your back. Don't worry. We're, we're going to go. And uh, Tennessee's on to the Sweet 16. And you continue to look at this team. Good guard play. A go-to shooter. Jemai Meshack was asked after the game, what was the difference in last year's Sweet 16 win, or the win that got you to the Sweet 16 over Duke, and this year's win over Texas that gets you to the Sweet 16? 
And Jemai Meshach, you know, just right off the cuff said, hey, don't connect. We got Dalton Connect. We have more, <laughs> we're healthy, we have Zakai, we have Dalton Connect, and, and we feel good about it, and we feel great about our defensive presence. And, and if you're a Tennessee fan here on a Monday morning, you should feel really good about your team. Will Tennessee win at all? I don't know. Will Tennessee go to its first ever Final Four? I don't know. Will Tennessee win on Friday night against Creighton and go to only its second Elite Eight ever in program history? I don't know. I hope so. But again, as we've been talking about continuously all basketball season and leading up into tournament play and postseason play, Tennessee is built better now than it ever has been to go and get it done. And it was just a great example of that against Texas. Again, that wouldn't go quietly in the night. And Tennessee is able to win a basketball game in the NCAA tournament, shooting 12% from three and 33% from the field. Don't apologize. Who cares? Literally, who cares? Anybody complaining after that win, don't watch the next game. Anybody complaining after a win in the second round of the NCAA tournament for your team when other teams are going home, when Kentucky goes home in the first round, when Kansas got sent home, when uh, a bunch of upsets have already happened, don't watch. Don't watch. I mean, that's just my advice for you because you're never going to be happy. Tennessee moves on to the Sweet 16, and uh, we're going to break down that matchup with Creighton all week long. We'll have some great guests on the show, and uh, I can't wait to uh, – to continue talking about the Tennessee basketball team. It's been it's been fun this weekend watching them, and I uh, can't wait to see if how far they continue to go and continue to climb. Hey, when we come back, speaking of a guy that's climbing right now, James Pierce on everybody's minds and everybody's list in the offseason, ESPN says James Pierce is the number one pass rusher. Why? We'll tell you that here in a moment uh, when we return right here on Lockdown Vols. Want to tell you about our friends over at Nissan. This week's March Madness bracket highlight is brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. Each week we're picking a team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like all the new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. Um, we're going to talk about Tennessee, obviously. I mean, Tennessee, uh, it's, it, it can be described as an armada. It was a two seed in the NCAA tournament. It gets out there, takes care of St. Peter's, takes care of Texas, and... Yeah, it, it didn't look flashy offensively, but the things that matter and the things that get the job done, defense, shooting free throws, uh, harassing your opponent defensively, that's what Tennessee did to live on and move on to the Sweet 16. They're going to be one of the favorites in the Sweet 16, as they should be. Uh, and just like the, the Nissan Armada, they're going to get the job done for you as well. You, you're going to be in a dependable vehicle and one that you got comfort in and one that's going to look good while you're cruising on down the ride. Tennessee Volunteers are like an Armada. The Oakland Golden Grizzlies, <laughs> obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a perhaps with a powerful performance in the first round upset against Kentucky, giving them the biggest win in program history. They say win life, go rogue. And that's exactly what the Golden Grizzlies have done here. Um, take on the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Also want to tell you about our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the tournament. Your bracket's not going to be ruined, or your your play over at FanDuel Sportsbook might not be ruined after the first day or the first week or the Sweet 16 matchup. You can continue to bet on every single game of the NCAA tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset of a one seed, maybe it's uh, time to go dancing on America's number one sports book for, for those upset picks as well. Right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 wins. That's 200 in bonus bets uh, to use on point spreads, money lines, even pick who's going to win it all. Cut down the nets when it's all said and done. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. One more time, it is FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on all the college hoops today until they cut down the nets. FanDuel, it is America's number one sports book. I want to welcome you back in here to your Monday morning of Lockdown Vols. We'll talk some James Pierce here. We'll talk a little spring practice here in segment number two, but also want to remind you, uh, Twitter Tuesday, X Tuesday, get in those questions, those comments, those concerns. I know some of you guys have already been reaching out to me over the weekend. I've done my best to bookmark those. If you want to bump those to make sure that I see them again and I can talk about them, please do. Um, at underscore Kaner, at Lockdown Vols on the YouTube channel as well, as well. Send me in your questions on Tennessee, this basketball team, the run, the Creighton matchup, Tennessee football recruiting from over the weekend. It was a big-time weekend for Tennessee football recruiting. Spring practice is going on right now. First scrimmage of spring practice going to be on Wednesday. And, of course, the Tennessee baseball team that we'll get into that here in segment number three. 
Um, all that and more you can ask on tomorrow's mailbag mailbag show right here on Lockdown Balls. So it was late last week, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, ESPN put out its list of uh, top pass rushers in college football for the 2024 season. And we had on our guy from Pro Football Focus, uh, Max Chadwick, last week talking about how he loves James Pierce. And we've seen James Pierce high on some other lists. I mean, James Pierce is going to be more, you know one of the darlings uh, for Tennessee football this offseason in terms of lists and, and rankings and all that. And you've already been seeing it. And James Pierce tops another list right here. This is ESPN's top pass rushers for 2024. Number one is James Pierce. List of stats for 2023, 10 sacks, 14 and a half TFLs, two forced fumbles. Said he got 58 points, five first place votes in their little voting system. This is what the article says about James Pierce. Tennessee signed six blue chippers in his 2022 recruiting class. Pierce wasn't one of them. Pierce wasn't one of them. Well, at on three, he was. Um, he had a blue chippers offer list of Georgia, Florida State, Oklahoma, Texas, and so on. And in only his first season as a regular, he quickly developed into one of the best pass rushers in the sport. He was seventh nationally with 10 sacks and fifth with 11 sacks created first pressures on what eventually become sacks. He boasted a 19% pressure rate. That's third nationally created pressures with uh, within 2.5 seconds of the snap on 10% of his uh, rushes. That's third in the country. He brought down the quarterback at least once in eight of 13 games, and he created at least three pressures in eight contests, including five of his last six. He was pro football focus highest graded SEC defensive lineman. Easy to see why Max Chadwick thinks that he can go number one in the draft in 2025, and he could have been the number one defensive player selected in this year's draft if he was eligible. Uh, this goes on to say, Pierce is listed as a lanky six foot five, two hundred forty two pounds, but he proved capable during damage, capable doing damage against the run too. Finishing the season with ten run stops, he was one of only twelve defenders and one of only two in the SEC with double digit run stops and sacks. He is an absolute menace, and uh, as he enters only his third year of college, he might still have more room to develop. That is written by Bill Conley. Uh, over here at ESPN.com. So James Pierce listed as the number one pass rusher in college football entering the 2024 season, according to ESPN. Who were some of those other pass rushers? And I asked M Max Chadwick this on last week's show. Who are some of those other better pass rushers that are going to be in league or be in conversation around James Pierce? Um, Ashton Gillot, Gillouette, I don't know his name, sorry. I don't watch ACC football uh, from Louisville is listed here at number two. A lot of new names in terms of pass rushers is kind of the old guard, not the old guard, but um, a lot of the, the nation's best pass rushers here the last two, three years have, have gone on to the NFL draft. Uh, Trey Moore from Texas is listed here at number three. Jack Sawyer of Ohio state is listed at number four. Ruben Bain jr. Of Miami is listed at number five. Uh, Cayman Rucker of North Carolina is listed at number six. Harold Perkins, we know that name. And could you imagine if Harold Perkins was an on-the-ball rusher instead of an off-the-ball rusher, meaning he plays back at the linebacker stand instead of up there on the edge? He could be even more, more of a menace uh, in the SEC. But that's Harold Perkins there at number seven. Um, JT Tumalolelo of Ohio State. I can't pronounce his name, and I do apologize, but he is a really good player. I know, I know who this is. A really, really good player. Um, Princely from Florida, who transferred to Ole Miss. He comes in here on this list at number nine. Uh, we know from being in the SEC what he's capable of and playing Florida every year. And then Antoine Powell Ryland of Virginia Tech uh, is here at number 10. Um, and uh, that, that's a pretty good list of, of pass rushers. Of note, um, there's a list of kind of some honorable mentions here at the bottom. And Tyler Barron. Uh, not all, not Tennessee, not Ole Miss, but now he's at Louisville. He's going to go to Louisville and play football. Um, he's listed here down the list in terms of honorable mentions. Of course, he had a really good year for Tennessee last year with six sacks and whatnot. So another example of uh, a, lot, a lot of hype, a lot of hype coming around Tennessee in 2024. Of course, you got Nico, but you've also got James Pierce, who's going to be one of the best pass rushers in college football, and hopefully he continues to build on what he did during his breakout 2023 campaign a quick look at spring practice not a whole lot to report from spring practice got to see some stretches and whatnot on friday so i appreciate that or on saturday morning um you do have um 
practice on Monday morning, so probably you know with the time you're listening to this, uh, they're out there on the practice field, and uh, they're going to practice here on a Monday. Glenn Ellerby, Tennessee offensive line coach, will talk afterwards, so he'll tell us how Lance heard, and um, you know he's doing a left tackle, integrating into the offensive system. John Campbell, how he's doing with the flip over to the right side. Some of these young guys, so I'll be intrigued to see what he has to say. Tuesday's going to be an off day. Wednesday's going to be scrimmage number one. Going to be a big day on Rocky Top, and, and hopefully we'll get some good notes on on what's going on for Tennessee in scrimmage number one. Josh Heupel will speak with us afterwards. And then there's, there's going to be the pro day, and uh, you get, you're going to have guys like Jalen Wright, of course, Kamal Haddon, Joe Milton, uh, Jabari Small, Ollie Lane, Jacob Warren, um, Romel Keaton, just to name a few of the guys that I've seen already here and, and getting ready for their pro day coming up on Wednesday. And uh, we'll be there and tell you how those guys uh, perform. And uh, best of luck to those guys. And then after that, Tennessee football's off off on Win- or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for an extended Easter weekend. So that's kind of the schedule for Tennessee in spring practice number two. But uh, scrimmage number one coming up on Wednesday, that is going to be a massive, massive uh, game and, and we'll have a lot of notes and we'll talk about it here on a Thursday lockdown balls tell you who did what and uh, who performed well hey when we come back we'll give you the, uh, the the notes of importance from Tennessee baseball over the weekend a series victory over Ole Miss that's coming up next as we continue on on this edition of lockdown balls when you're hiring for small business you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role that's why you got to check out linkedin jobs linkedin jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free Uh, linkedin isn't just another job board linkedin has a vast network of more than a billion professionals which makes it the best place to hire it gives you access to professionals that you can't find anywhere else linkedin does all this while making the process super easy and super intuitive hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates so easy in fact that 86 percent of small businesses can get qualified candidate within 24 hours that's why 2.5 million small businesses right now are using linkedin for hiring and you can too post your job for free over at linkedin.com slash locked on college that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions do apply more locked on balls coming up next All right, we continue on here on this Monday edition of the show. Appreciate you guys for being here. And as a lot of you guys have requested, um, we're going to talk a little baseball here in the third segment of a Monday show. Big weekend for Tennessee baseball. And again, I invite you, if you're not a big baseball fan or you're, you've never really been a big follower of Tennessee baseball, but you love the Vols and you love winning, well, I mean, Tennessee baseball is a team that's done a lot of that here of late. Uh, two out of the past three seasons, Tony Botello has led Tennessee to the College World Series. And that's really, really good. And Tennessee baseball coming off a series loss to open SEC play last weekend at Alabama, where it won uh, handily in, in game one and then lost a couple of tight ones in games two and three. And so you wanted to bounce back on the right foot. Of course, midweek, you had the midweek, no issues there. And then on Friday night, Tennessee did just that. Won 15 to three, a run roll victory in seven innings. And A.J. Causey was fantastic. Christian Moore homered twice. Tennessee scored I want to say like five runs in the second inning, all with two outs. I mean, Tennessee got off to a great start, and that was great to see. On Saturday, though, it was unfortunate. Tennessee does fall by a score of eight to five, the final score, and and um, you know Drew Beam well, was not his best overall in the day, but he was certainly not you know his worst. You look down at the stat sheet, and you know towards the end of his line, it's like wow, okay, well he's done this, he's done this, he's given you a, a good chance to win. AJ Russell came in in relief. And was in line to get the win because Tennessee had a, a victory there, or Tennessee had the lead, um, but but he kind of fell apart there in the ninth, and of course he had to be removed by an injury, and that's one of the biggest takeaways from this weekend. AJ Russell, who was your Friday night starter, who missed two starts, um, you know, with 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 general soreness, came back and and started on Sunday uh, at Alabama and kind of you know threw 40 pitches, and they were trying to stretch him out and build him back up, and and, and Tony Vitale didn't list a game three starter for this weekend. And this is a very common practice um, because if you're in a position late in a Friday game or late in a Saturday game and you want to keep it tight or you want to lock down a, a save or something just to go ahead and take the series, you'll throw a lot of the times, who, you know, who your game three starter was going to be. And and that's what Tennessee did here with A.J. Russell. Now, you know, I, it was important for A.J. Russell to continue to build back up. I thought he should have thrown like 60, you know, 65 pitches 
and he would have easily been able to do that with a start. But he did not. He came on and he pitched the last three innings plus of that game on Saturday. He ended up getting 69 pitches, which is really, really good for him. And he did some good things uh, a lot of the times, but um, had to be had had to leave the game in the ninth inning. It was a four run ninth inning for Ole Miss. Had to leave the game in the ninth inning with um, it's what Tony Vitello described as forearm tightness, and that is not what you ever ever want to hear. And so we're going to keep track on, on AJ Russell throughout this week. I hope to have more information Tuesday night on, on kind of his status and. Um, you know, depending on how long he'll be out, that's a big blow for Tennessee because A.J. Russell is arguably the best pitcher, one of the best pitchers on this roster, and so you hate that for him. And ultimately, it was because it kind of unraveled there, and Aaron Combs, you know, came on to kind of stop the bleeding in the ninth inning. But it was a it was a full run ninth inning when Tennessee led in that baseball game, and it was a late comeback at Ole Miss uh, down Tennessee in Game Two on Saturday night. So you didn't really know who was going to start on Sunday. Um, had a lot of questions going in there. Is it going to be back-to-back weekends of Tennessee losing a rubber match? Well, that was not the case. Almost identical ball games as Sunday to Friday. Tennessee won 15 to four and was in line to win 15 to three, if not for a solo home run with two outs in the seventh inning, right before a run rule victory uh, for Old Mi- or a home run for Ole Miss, a victory for Tennessee. Final score 15 to four in seven innings, and Tennessee just dominated like it like it does. Um, Xander Seacrest got the start, and that was great. And the thought process behind Xander getting the start was that he was going to collect you know, as many outs as he could, try to steal some outs before Nate Snead comes in and gives you a long relief. And, and Nate Snead came in in a high-leverage situation, top of the third, one out, runners at first and second, and he got out of it and preserved that line for Xander Seacrest uh, to two, a th- two and a third, you know, a couple of hits, one run, a couple of strikeouts. And uh, overall, you know, hats off to Sanders Seacrest. He did exactly what was asked for him. I mean, you know, they gave him the ball and said, hey, go get us in between six and nine outs, please. And, and he got you seven. And um, he kind of stole some of those outs at the beginning of the game because he is a starter. He he knows what it takes to kind of go through that process, throwing a bullpen before the game, kind of going out there in the first inning or so. And so you know, Tony Vitello and Frank Anderson, the coaching staff, Frank Anderson also got ejected uh, from the baseball game on Saturday and was suspended on Sunday. But um, they thought that was the best direction for the team, and ultimately it was. It panned out. Nate Snead came in and did a great job um, pitching the final four innings and two thirds. I'm still confused on, you know, why not just start Nate Snead? I, I I don't I don't know why. If he's going to pitch you between four and five innings on a Sunday, why not let them be the first four to five innings? That, that's kind of my my thought process. But again, I'm not getting paid millions of dollars to coach baseball like those guys, and they they turned out some good pitchers and led teams to Omaha, so I'm not I'm not doubting them. But uh, it was a great bounce back for Tennessee at the plate. Christian Moore homered again. He is now, you know, we're talking about Blake Burke breaking Luke Lipsius' program record for 40 home runs. We've been talking about Blake Burke and Blake Burke and Blake Burke, and Christian Moore was four back of Blake Burke entering the weekend. He homered twice on Friday to make it 35 career home runs. He homered once, no, I'm sorry, 36 career home runs. He homered once on Sunday to make it 37 career home runs. So now we enter a new week, and not only is Blake Burke really incredibly close to breaking Tennessee's all-time home run record of 40, but so is Christian Moore. Blake Burke sits in a tie for third place with VFL and, and Major League Baseball Hall of Famer Todd Helton with 38 career home runs. Moore is right behind them at 36. Evan Russell's at 39, and Luke Lipsius is at 40. So both those guys are going to surpass Luke Lipsius, you know, barring injury, here in the next few games, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to watch that. But Christian Moore had a big game on Sunday. Billy Amick, what if I told you that Billy Amick had not driven in a run since March the 8th against Illinois on a Friday night? You'd say I'm crazy, right? Well, that was the case. Billy Amick recorded his first RBI, not only his first RBI, but he hit a grand slam on Sunday. Huge day for Billy Amick, so that was good to see. Kavars Tears had a... Um, had a two-run home run. Dean Curley had a three-hit day. He had a solo home run as well. Just a really, really great team win for Tennessee on Sunday. And, and those Sunday games, because you have bullpen questions, I'm going to write about it in the 3-2-1 this week. There's a lot of bullpen questions. you got a lot of questions about your staff. You're going to have to win some games with, with the bats, like scoring eight, nine runs, especially on Sundays. You're going to have to you know, do your best getting to double digits, and that's exactly what Tennessee did on Sunday. So uh, Tennessee wins its first SEC series of the season in its second try. Tennessee now has an impressive uh, record overall of 21-4 and four and 3-3 three and three in Southeastern Conference play. And remember, if you finish 500 in Southeastern Conference play, that's pretty good. 
if you finish 14 and 16 in Southeastern Conference play, typically you're a regional team. Um, so, you know, being three and three right now, you're on pace, you're doing a good job. So a good weekend for Tennessee baseball. We'll have loads to talk about it. We'll break it all down on the three, two, one and, and, uh, you know, the porch podcast and all that more over at VolQuest.com. But, uh, you wanted some baseball talk here on Locked On Balls. I'm giving it to you. Hope you uh, hope you liked it. I liked a, a lot of Christian Moore this weekend. AJ Causey continues just to be really really good in the Friday night role. You don't touch that with a 10 foot pole right now. It's going really really well. Thought Nate Snead bounced back really really well on Sunday. Good to see Billy Amick the way he is. Dean Curley, KT, um, and, and then and the Simo. And then of course a guy I haven't even mentioned yet, Blake Burke, who has a uh, wait for it. I want to get this correct. Blake Burke, who has a let's see here Blake Burke who now has 14 doubles on the season extended his is it uh, extended his hit streak on Sunday to 15 games and his on base streak to 23 games man Blake Burke is um really really good and he finished the game actually going three for three three for three at the plate is that right is that a typo from from your boy Eric Kane no Blake Burke Two for three. Okay, he, he finished the game going two for three. Two for three. Nonetheless, a really, really good game for Blake Burke. Tennessee baseball bounced back in a big way, and we'll see what they look like. Midweek rivalry game coming up. Tennessee Tech on Tuesday, and then back at home against Georgia at Lindsey Nelson Stadium this weekend for uh, Easter weekend. Hey, it's been a fun show. Tennessee continues to dance in the NCAA tournament. We'll talk a lot of Creighton. We'll have guests on to talk about Tennessee's performance in the round of 32 and 64. We'll continue to discuss Tennessee in the Sweet 16, all that coming up this week. Spring football practice, scrimmage on Wednesday. Uh, mailbag questions, please send those in. We'll get to those on tomorrow's show and whatever else pops up. Tennessee Athletics Wise. Appreciate you guys for tuning in. You everydayers for making it a part of your routine. Can't thank you enough. This is Locked On Balls.